We hope you enjoyed the presentations for Module 2. These presentations provide you some feedback on Exercises 1 and 2 for the module to allow you to judge how you went in completing the tasks. Feedback on the extension exercise will be provided at the end of the course. In Exercise 1 for this module, we ask you to identify the issues that would be considered during conceptual design based on the focus on the life cycle for the domestic dwelling rather than just a focus on the acquisition or the construction of the system. First, a little revision. Remember, we discussed during the module how during the acquisition phase we need to take into account the issues that will relate to the system throughout its entire life. That is, we need to design the system not just to be acquired, that is, to be constructed, but also to be operated, to be maintained, and ultimately, to be retired. So here, by way of example, we're focusing on the impact of design on the utilisation phase and the retirement phase, where the system will be utilised and maintained by the owner in the utilisation phase, so that, it, that means somebody will live in it and they'll conduct the required maintenance, prior to it finally being retired in the retirement phase. Retirement could be through disposal, via destruction, or most likely, of course, it'll be retired by selling it to another owner. As seen in the first week exercises, a domestic dwelling could take many forms. It could be a suburban house, a townhouse, an apartment, a flat, and so on. During conceptual design, the designers want to make sure that they would consider as many of the relevant issues as possible. If we focused on just the construction of the house itself, many of the other life cycle aspects would not be considered. So for example, how will the owners use the system? Is it a family dwelling, or is it built for a single person? What functions do they want? For example, we can't suddenly add a garage or a swimming pool in the future if we've not left enough room on the site during the original build. Secondly, what maintenance issues need to be considered? For example, if access is required to the roof space, how large is that access, where is it located, and so on. If access is required to air conditioning units, where is that access required, and what, what is needed to access it, does it need a ladder, uh, how much space is needed, and so on. And finally, of course, there are issues like how are the owner is intending to dispose of it. Do they intend to sell it? Do uh, they intend to sell it immediately? Will they wait for some period of time? Will they own it for a short period, upgrade it as their family grows, and then sell? All these things will change the way in which the family or the owners of the system build the system. So there are many, many issues to be addressed. These are just uh, a small number. Let's have a look at a few more in detail that each of you may have identified when you were doing the exercises. Operational use issues. Well, the operational issues that we need to consider for the dwelling are many and varied, and we've just noted a few here. There are many common uses we won't have time to cover, and it's very important to not forget them and to articulate them for the system as we're designing it. For the purposes of exercises here, though, we'll really only consider a small number of the life cycle issues. But first, and I guess foremost, is how will the dwelling be used? Will it be a family home? and therefore it requires multiple bedrooms, or is it a dwelling of a single person? Second, what's, what about future growth? How will the dwelling be used in the future? When a single person or a couple acquires a dwelling, they need to consider whether they plan to have children in the future. Perhaps elderly parents may move in. Will they need additional storage space? Will they need to be able to provide space to park additional cars in the future? Then we could consider entertainment. Does the dwelling require space to have parties, functions and gatherings? If so, is it expected that additional sleeping space is required, which also requires consideration for parking? If, for example, a secure parking in an apartment block, can visitors use it? Do they have to use on-street parking, or is there even any on-street parking available at all? If there's an exercise function, does the owner intend to conduct exercise at home? Are they shift workers and can't make it to a gym easily, and do they want to be able to exercise therefore when they get home? Is the owner intending to put a, a swimming pool in for exercise? If, for example, they want a home gym, will they change the equipment regularly, and how will they get the heavy equipment in and out, particularly if it's a basement gym, for example? This could drive uh, requirements for a large entry and exit doors for ease of equipment installation and removal. There are other operational issues, including security, which is both applicable to the people living in the dwelling as well as to their belongings. If the owner is intending to use the property as a holiday house, as mentioned previously, the dwelling may require higher levels of security, particularly when people aren't present, 
and a different type of security, uh, video cameras for example in conjunction with alarms as opposed to just a fence. This could also result in changes about how the external shape of the building is designed to ensure clear fields of view for cameras. Then how will entertainment be provided? If one of the main uses of the dwelling is for home entertainment, perhaps for a home theatre, how will acoustics be managed? Is the location of the theatre at the front of the house near a busy road going to cause issues? If it's located at the front, can we fix that with noise dampening glass in, in the windows with double glazing for example? Or can we locate the window so that we minimise the amount of light that comes into the room or do we need thick curtains to be able to minimise that? Lastly, just by way of example, will the dwelling be utilised to conduct work? If it is, it may drive requirements for a home office to be included as part of the actual building. Or will, are they prepared to work on the kitchen table or is there a pull-out desk in one of the bedrooms? Now with that comes potential requirements for computers, phone lines, uh, additional storage, perhaps secure storage, uh, internet, wireless internet for example, other networks. They may even require space for business related visitors. Access to the office may need to be from the front of the building uh, rather than the back and they may even need a waiting area if it's a small office and perhaps even some off street parking. Now there are so many uses of a dwelling that could be considered, uh, but obviously that depends on how important those uses are to stakeholders. And so we can't here provide you with a complete list, we're just simply trying to show you some examples which would have been similar to the sorts of things you considered when you did the exercise. Of course all uses that are of importance will influence the derivation of functional requirements and hence the design of the dwelling in the conceptual design phase of the system life cycle. Early consideration of these issues helps to ensure that the delivered system meets the owner's needs. And so it's very important for us then, very early in conceptual design, to ensure that we understand what it is that the owner needs out of their building, because their needs are almost always going to be quite considerably unique. Now as well as um, those issues, the, the operational issues, we've also got system support issues. There are many of those such things, but let's just consider a few. We'd need to worry about exterior maintenance. The type of exterior service of a dwelling affects the cost associated with maintenance throughout its life. If a surface such as timber is used, then it requires treatment through painting or oiling to reduce the rate at which it decays. And eventually, of course, it needs to be retreated and then finally replaced. Those timber services may be cheaper initially compared to other services, perhaps that cost of continued maintenance and then replacement would make the whole of life cost of that surface more expensive than a more expensive initial cost, for example for a brick surface. So the longer lasting surface such as brick may prove to be less expensive over the life of the dwelling, even though it may have cost more to install in the first instance. We also need to consider documentation, something we normally don't worry about for a house, but during conceptual design, the way in which we've planned and, and designed documentation and how we've stored it is important to us, particularly in other systems. So for example, we need to know the layout of the plumbing and the wiring. This is necessary so when we conduct repairs or conducting renovations or minor improvements, it's a simple matter of knowing where the power systems run. It's even important for, for simple things like hanging a picture in the wall and driving a nail through the plasterboard to know where the power wiring is. Having this information well documented will enable easier support of the dwelling throughout its operational life and even into a disposal. We may also consider some preemptive aspects of the design. For example, if we can't afford to have an in-ground watering system uh, in the first instance, but we plan to put one in the future, it may actually be useful to preemptively lay the least expensive component of that, which is the piping, which could then be there so that when we subsequently install the watering system, it's much easier to do because we don't have to dig up our, our newly laid lawns or our beautiful gardens that have been established since we built the house. We could just simply add the sprinklers and the control systems when we could afford them. Similarly, there are many items that can't be afforded initially, but may have elements included in the initial building, so that it's relatively easy to add the a major item or the more expensive items later in the life of the building. For example, in an alarm system, we may lay the relatively inexpensive cabling in the wall and then later on install the more expensive control units and uh, sensors. 
Other support system issues include uh, access requirements. These are very important because we need to make sure that we can gain access at a later date uh, to things that we need to be able to maintain or, or, we, or actually withdraw and replace. These things could be very expensive, particularly if we're knocking down load-bearing brick walls. If the dwelling has a large portion of electrical wiring or plumbing running through uh, specified areas, providing a method of access to that area, like under the house for example, makes supporting the dwelling in the event of a system failure, that is if you've got a blocked pipe or some problem with the cabling, much easier and much cheaper in the future. Similarly, if there's a possibility that a pool or other large system or structure could be required at the rear of the property, just ensuring that we have sufficient access to allow maintainers and other people to get access to that system should be considered during conceptual design. There are also many maintenance issues. Previously we touched on the maintenance of the exterior surface of the dwelling. Similarly, the interior surfaces such as the floor should be considered because different flooring materials require significantly different support throughout their life. Timber floors require vacuuming, mopping and, and potentially recoding and or polishing in the future a number of times throughout their life. Carpets wear out, they require vacuuming and most likely will require professional cleaning and potential uh, replacement over relatively short periods. Now polished concrete of course would last a lot longer but it's not terribly aesthetically pleasing to all owners. The choice of flooring therefore needs to be driven by the intended use of the property whether it's a, a, a high traffic areas, whether you've got children, whether it's a holiday home and so on, as well as the support issues and the through life costs of maintaining those systems. But of course, as we pointed out before with polished concrete floors, whilst that might be the hardest wearing, most uh, cheapest, most cost effective solution through life, it might not actually be the preferred solution of the business owners who might, some, might like something that looks slightly nicer. Um, a family with young children, for example, might want quick and easy surfaces to clean in the event of spills, and so carpet might not be a useful thing in the first instance. Now, as was the case with the issues associated with operational use, these are just a few of the possible life cycle support issues that will be considered during conceptual design. Let's go on to the retirement phase. Now, retirement phase issues are discussed in much more detail in the extension exercise for Module 3. But for, for completeness and to show you the full sort of impact of the life cycle, we'll cover a number of issues here. Now, there are some key considerations during conceptual design which are relevant to the retirement of the system, in this case, a dwelling. For example, how do the users actually envisage retiring the system? Will they uh, sell it? How quickly will they sell it? Or are they going to wait until the building, live in it for as long as they can, and wait until it can no longer be occupied and destroy it? Throughout its life, sale of the property will be the normal method of retirement, of course, as the house moves between life cycles. Consequently, the design of the house must be attractive to the largest number of people possible to maximise the sale price. We don't want to design our house so uniquely for our needs that it doesn't meet the needs of potential buyers, or rather, only meets the needs of a very small number of potential buyers. During conceptual design, the intended resale target needs to be the most attractive range of people to increase our possibility of sale. If the resale target is a family, but it's being acquired for a couple, is it worth building perhaps the extra rooms for a family, even though the original owners as a couple don't need those rooms? Selection of the building materials could also drive whether the resale is aiming for a higher price, potentially a longer term sale, or a lower price. That is, the owners want to uh, minimise the acquisition cost in order to maximise their profit in a quick sale. Now, of course, eventually the dwelling will reach the end of its life, and well, either because it's completely run down or it's been destroyed by fire or flood, and it needs to be destroyed. In that case, the uh, destruction will, will be uh, predicated upon the original selection of the materials, the complexity of the design, and um, how easy those materials are to destroy, and how easy the house is to, is to actually pull down. If hazardous materials are utilised, it would be more expensive in both time and money to destroy the dwelling. Similarly, if the design of the home is complex and requires a very specific way to be able to safely drop the walls, for example, then it will take much longer and cost more. And as we mentioned briefly before, if the dwelling was for an investment, over the life of the dwelling, the owners will be aiming to maximise profit. Having an expensive destruction cost and then therefore um, reducing the profit over the life 
and having to perhaps to be recouped in the uh, the price of this of the apartment complex which is replacing it will reduce the overall profit of the business. As you can see, there is much to consider, and we've really only discussed a very small number of life cycle issues to be considered in conceptual design. To illustrate the importance of a life cycle focus, let's now look at one of the benefits of considering such issues so early in the design process. In this second exercise, we ask you to identify how the application of systems engineering can potentially result in significant cost savings across the life cycle of our domestic dwelling. Now, of course, there are many factors that contribute to that, and we've already mentioned quite a few in the previous exercise. We've got aspects of the design, such as construction, uh, the cost of uh, rectification or, or, or maintenance in the future, the cost of building materials, the fees and charges associated with disposal, all of those things will, will attract cost to the owner. Many of the costs of the system are related in one way or another to time. For example, if construction takes longer than expected, the owner may be required to pay additional fees and penalties to contractors who have been employed to make the system. Even construction materials may cost more as a result of something as simple as missing a sale from the end of a financial year sale, for example, or having to pay additional storage fees and delivery cancellation fees. Now, as you should be able to see from the examples provided here, time is also related to risk. If your construction schedule is high risk, then it is more likely you'll incur greater costs during construction. Now, in the notes for this module, we provided a graph which showed the difficulty with which changes are made based on the life cycle phase that the system is in. As it shows here, the difficulty and cost of making changes increases later in the life cycle. Therefore, systems engineering aims to spend time in the conceptual and preliminary design phases of a life cycle because time spent there will minimise the risk that something will be incorrect and therefore will require change in a later phase and therefore cost more. So let's look at some examples of how this might occur in a domestic dwelling. Let's start by looking at the potential savings in the construction and or development phase of a domestic dwelling's life cycle. While there are opportunities to make savings in the detailed design development phase based on decisions made in the conceptual design phase, the construction or development phase is where systems engineering arguably produces the major changes. First, accuracy of the design. During construction and, and production, the owner starts to be able to see the actual physical elements they have asked for and any discrepancies will become very obvious. For example, they can see whether the foundations of the dwelling have been correctly situated on the block. If the user specified that they wanted the front door to face the side of the property, not the front street, they now can confirm whether it's actually true by looking at the engineering drawings. If the owner comes out for a site inspection and requires the foundation to be moved, that's a costly mistake that results from poor systems engineering during early design. Even if the owner accepts a mistake, there will still be no doubt significant costs because other plans, such as plumbing and electricity and other aspects such as council approvals, may need to be redone. Second, material selection. During construction, the large majority of materials are being purchased and utilised. During earlier phases, system engineering should have driven the design through an iterative process to refine the requirements. If the design has been optimised at the system level, then some expensive elements, such as load-bearing structural materials, for example, could have been refined to the maximum extent possible so that we minimise the cost of those materials. For example, does the entire frame of the house need to be metal, or can elements which require higher strength be metal and other elements be timber? Given the climate, what cooling or heating requirements are required, and perhaps the design of the house, although it might be a bit more expensive, might then reduce the cost of heating and cooling through life. So is it cheaper to install an air conditioning system or to pay more for insulation materials in the walls? And we'll talk about this more in, in the next phase. Finally, design selection. The appropriateness of the design is also important. If it's too complicated, which requires highly skilled tradesmen or expensive tools, the dwelling may be too difficult to build and therefore have an increased cost, as well, of course, take much longer for construction. Now, the utilisation phase is the time when the requirements for the system are ultimately tested. It's not until the user sees the end product that they can be confident that they've received the system they thought they were going to get. Let's look at some examples. First, power. 
One topical issue in most countries is the cost of power. Air conditioning is a good example of this. If the construction and production stage, the cost of putting a reverse cycle air conditioning system can actually be quite significantly less than putting in insulation in the ceilings and walls to provide warmth in winter and cooling in summer. However, during the utilisation phase, the house may be found to be too hot in summer, so an air conditioner must be on all day and night to be able to make it comfortable to live in. This is not what the owner was expecting when they had a functional user requirement for a comfortable temperature for the dwelling because it also breaches other requirements they had for being able to have an affordable power cost. By following a rigorous system engineering process, it's hoped that these issues wouldn't occur because all throughout conceptual and preliminary design, the utilisation cost of a power bill would have been taken into account and traded off against the acquisition cost of, of insulation in the walls so that the owner was happy with the entire through-life cost. Access requirements is another issue where system engineering can result in savings if such requirements are considered early. For example, the owner may have a sports car that's very low to the ground and scrapes the exhaust as it enters a steep driveway. Or elderly relatives who require wheelchair access or ramp access can't climb the large number of stairs at the entrance because these issues weren't addressed. It doesn't take much before small changes can result in costly modifications to enable the building to be utilised as the customer originally expected. The biggest uh, saving in costs is probably in maintenance, and that's probably the area where the most savings can be made in almost any of the utilisation phase of almost any system. If the dwelling is an apartment in our case, who's responsible for the maintenance? What areas are they responsible for? There's no point in buying a cheap apartment that has very high body corporate fees. Now, if the owner is not aware of these obligations, then that cheaper acquisition cost compared to others may actually then be offset by the requirement for additional maintenance. Similarly, as we spoke about before, if the building is brick, the cost of maintenance will be much lower than if it's timber, and so these issues need to be taken into account as early as possible. The last example here is uh, for storage. If there is insufficient storage, then the owner will be required to either modify the building to provide additional storage by adding in additional wardrobes and storage rooms, or to purchase additional storage to place within the dwelling, so uh, extra cabinets and so on, or perhaps to a higher secure storage off-site. All of these incur additional above-expected costs that could have been resolved by following a good system engineering approach that led to a correct understanding of what the user required, in this case with regard to storage, as early as possible. The last phase of any system's life is retirement or disposal. We saw in exercise one that there are two main issues in addressing the disposal of a dwelling, either resale to a different owner or demolition at the end of its life. It's important to recognise that resale to a different owner is not the end of the system's life, that is the, the system is still around, it's just that it's not part of our life cycle but it is the end of the system's life in the context of the requirements under which it was acquired. That is, the original owner's requirements are no longer the same necessarily as the requirements of the new owner. In a lot of older houses, asbestos was commonly used. However, as we know now, this is hazardous to health. Therefore, the disposal costs associated with asbestos are a lot higher than for a standard timber or metal home. This applies to many, if not all, hazardous materials. Because system engineering looks at the whole life cycle considerations, early consideration of the cost of disposal will have an effect on the materials to be utilised in construction. Similarly, if the design of the dwelling is complex, the way in which it was demolished, if being destroyed, could increase the cost of demolition, as more people are required to demolish it, perhaps explosives are required to demolish um, reinforced concrete, and more equipment may be required. However, as demolishing the dwelling is one option, complexity of disposal also applies to resale. For example, if the dwelling attracts additional fees and charges to its sale, or has specific requirements for its sale, which makes it more costly and harder to sell. And closely linked to all of those things, then, is return on the investment. If the dwelling is purchased as an investment property, then the goal is to make as much money as possible as profit from that investment. If the dwelling is very unique, then the number of potential buyers is likely to be much smaller, reducing the likely resale price, or at least extending the time it takes to sell the property. Similarly, if demolition costs are higher than expected, then the overall life cycle profit 
is reduced. Well, we hope you enjoyed the Module 2 exercises. Don't forget, the Module 2 extension exercise is also available.